seven, five, four, four three, two, one. And we're live in. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again in one of our cerebrovascular Q&A on Swedish and Sierra Science Foundation. My name is uh, Matthias Costa, I'm one of the Cerebrovascular Fellows here. I want to thank Dr. McDowell and the whole crew of uh, attendings for helping us putting this together. Uh, today we have the glee pressure of uh, inviting uh, Professor H.A. Waklu. He directed the Neuro Interventional Radiology Program at Beth Israel Lahey Health and Medical Center from 2018 to 23, and is currently professor at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. He did medical school and entire medical education and residencies in Germany at the University of Mainz uh, and Freiburg, including a fellowship in interventional radiology. Over there, Dr. Walu did neurovascular research at the VNI Phoenix uh, at, the, at the Barrow Institute and in endovascular neurosurgery fellowship at Sunny Buffalo till 1999. He was the director of neuroendovascular program at the University of Miami until 2004. Then he moved to Massachusetts and directed the neurovascular program at the New England Center for Stroke Research until 2018. He has been the PI and co-investigator of numerous grants uh, from the NIH, private foundations, and industry, and has authored and co-authored over 300 papers, book chapters uh, in every field of uh, neuroendovascular. He pioneered the field of flow diversion, started in 1989, he received multiple scientific awards, honors, including uh, uh, the Whitaker Bioengineering Research Foundation Award, the Sherman Society of Neuroradiology, a Society of Vascular Interventional Neurology Award. Uh, in 2009, he was named a fellow of the American Heart Association and the Stroke Council, and in 2022, a fellow of the New Society of Neurointerventional Surgery. Uh, he holds multiple titles, honorary members of multiple societies. Uh, there is so much more to say about Dr. Waklu, but I don't want to take his time because it's very precious. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. Really appreciate it. And you can share your screen. First of all, thank you, Dr. Costa, for the kind introduction. And I want to thank also Dr. McDougall, who I know for more than 20 years now, for the kind invitation. And of course, my thanks goes also to the Seattle Science Foundation. Um, I would like to talk today about a journey that, uh, you know, took probably major part of my career, and that was the development and inception of flow diversion. I will give you some background on research and then take you to um, photobiomodulation, which is what I think will be the next front end in endovascular treatment where we are bringing regenerative medicine into our field. These are my disclosures. Some of the work was funded through R01 grants and currently I'm conflicted with, as you see, different companies in different uh, positions but that's not relevant to this presentation at this point. I think flow diverter, uh, flow diverter or the concept is an excellent example of integration of physiology, engineering principles, and biology, where a group of several uh, folks have come together to solve a very complex medical challenge. I think it's the most scientific scrutinized endovascular treatment for brain aneurysms uh, so far. And I do truly believe that it's superior to previous endovascular treatments and even to surgical clipping provided proper selection of patient system. And I think it sets the stage for body to repair itself. For those who are interested in looking into deeper into this matter, I would highly recommend the book here, co-authored by your own professor, Dr. Cameron McDougall, and other authors are listed here as well. The journey took over 30 years, and I want to th thank several of my students, postgrads, uh, postdoc students, and also medical students and colleagues, especially to be named Dr. Lieber, 
who shared with me the journey over the last 30 years. My colleague, Yost the Fritz, neurosurgeon from Nijmegen, was a, a very critical part as well. And of course, along the way, we, we, uh, while we move from one academic institution to the other, we have to thank many of the thought leaders here, Nick Hopkins and Walter Grant and Lee Garamang, the early days at uh, SUNY Buffalo. Now, what is critical when we um, innovate, and there were two things that, you know, felt into my lap was flow diversion and stand travers. When we worked on these concepts, the critical part is, is in my opinion, um, observation. Observation when things don't go right and surprises happen. Instead of giving up because it didn't work or it failed, one should dig deeper into the matter and see why did it fail and then start working from there. Of course, perseverance is very important in this field. And I was lucky enough that these things at the early stages uh, were exciting enough and these observations led me to, um, to where I am today. Um, and I want to encourage the young folks who are listening today to, uh, if they are excited in this field, which I am thinking is a growing tremendous potential, to dig deeper into things and matters that are unsolved. And uh, there's a lot of potential, like I said, to solve these problems. Let me dig a little bit into the direction of data that you know very well. And that is that aneurysms, and that's the topic of today's presentation, Aneurysms have a higher risk for rupturing, of course, when they get larger. That's not a secret, has been shown by all clinical trials. Anterior circulation, uh, as for compared to posterior circulation, the numbers are a little bit different, but the posterior circulation, even for endovascular treatment, remains critical. These are different scores. This is a phase score that some of us use. I used to use it. I've moved away from that um, a little bit because there is no detailed uh, data on smoking or history of, of hypertension, which may be critical for some of the patients that we are treating. Now. This is another way to plotting the risk, uh, the phases score risk here from the Dutch group put nicely together that as, as big as the bigger the aneurysms get, the higher the uh, probability of aneurysm rupture is. And I think with machine learning AI, we can even uh, predict with higher precision these uh, values. Now, when we go to the to the uh, posterior circulation or aneurysms that are fusiform in nature, the mortality of endovascular treatment, if at all treatable, goes, goes significantly up and uh, that applies for surgery as well. Now, what do we expect for endovascular treatments for brain aneurysm? We, we expect that there's a safety profile, but also an efficacy, which comes next in line. But there are other challenges. As we know, low and high income countries have a different way of treating uh, the same diseases here, global needs because of the economy, because of uh, the accessibility, training standards. All that is becoming more and more as the world is uniting a challenge. Now, going back to a, a landmark paper here from Yuchi Murayama, the, UCL, the UCLA group, put nicely together at that time, Fernando Vinuela was running the program, that the larger the aneurysms get, the higher the risk of re-canalization if they are treatable or due to coil compaction. Now, what is coil compaction? This is a picture that's very well known to you, a supraclinoid aneurysm, an MCA rupture aneurysm treated with coils. And you see at follow-up, this compression of coil masses, which is due to to energy transfer basically to the to the solid material, which then loses its its uh, primary state and breaks down in in these structures. And here you see the MC aneurysm is already starting opening up. There's maybe some filling in the center. Now we can compute that if we go and do a computational work on these aneurysms, and we assume, for example, for this Bagler top aneurysm which remains a challenge for all of us for endovascular treatment. When we assume that the, the cross-section of the artery here, the basilar trunk and the aneurysm has the same size, that would be a ratio of one, or if it is smaller, what are the energy or the, the, the forces that act on a coil mass that's being delivered into the aneurysm? And that explains then why these aneurysms recanalize due to material fatigue. And this is plotted now the size of the neck of the aneurysm and the basilar trunk, the ratio would be one. So that would mean 
that the maximum amount of the energy during the pulse cycle is basically translated to the surface of the coil mass. And the forces, when you compute them, are somewhere around 270 dynes with each pulse cycle. That is like taking a small coin and throwing at the coil mass, small dime, and throwing at the coil mass with every pulse cycle. And obviously, what happens then to the material, it just fatigues and starts creating a coil compression. So the goal of endovascular treatment is how do we get clotting and scarring and subsequently an endothelization at the neck while hydrodynamic forces do not lead to an implant fatigue. So we are basically creating a race between closure of the neck, clotting, scarring, and yet uh, preventing a fatigue of the material. That's why we're, what we are doing with the flow diverter, we are trying to create a scaffold where the endothelial can grow and yet at the same time uh, impact on the flow dynamics that's basically entertaining that coil compaction or even, even an aneurysm growth and, and rupture. This is a case I did in Baylor a while ago with, with Peter Khan, who you know. This was a young uh, guy, 11-year-old boy, who had headaches with the dissecting aneurysm of the MCA. And as you know, here nicely described by Bose and Spetzler in their book, how you would have treated this aneurysm probably five, 10 years ago. You would skeletonize the vessel, you would do a short bypass graft, and the results were very good. But there are not many people who can treat it, and the excess is a critical component for our field. So what we did is, and that was not even complicated, we went up with the micro catheter, and you know that placed a, a pipeline device. We then angioplasted it, and the dissection part didn't open up, and we used a drug eluting coronary stent to overcome the forces. And then the, the follow-up was uh, impressive. This was immediately, you see already that part of the aneurysm doesn't even um, participate in the in the flow dynamics of uh, the parent vessel and aneurysm. So it starts thrombosing and clotting, and that's, of course, a progressive process. And when we bring the patient back here six months, a remodeling has happened here to the artery. Endothelial coverage has probably occurred. We don't know that. Maybe OCT technology will shed more light on that. The narrowing that was the dissecting part is still there, as you see, and that will take more time. And what often you see also is that the, the, the branch of the vessel that's covered by the flow diverter obviously doesn't feel as prominent integrally and gets some blood supply from other side. These dynamic principles are very interesting and important to understand. So where did the journey stand, uh, started? I was, as you see, always born bald, and therefore I believed in porosity and material that are porous. So the journey started back in Freiburg in 1989. I was a fellow where we were trying to use a balloon expandable and self-expanding stents to keep the detachable balloons and coils within the aneurysm. They would drop out. So that's where the observation came. So these are the aneurysm that Dr. De Vries and Vera von Feldhofen used to create for us. These were venous pouch aneurysm in the Kainan model, sidewall aneurysms. And then we placed the stent and I, the plan was for me to go through the stent truss and place some coils. And whenever we would place the stent, the aneurysm would disappear. And when we did then follow up, seven or six months follow up, what we would see is that these aneurysms were scarred and there was an endothelial coverage that was basically prominent and sealing the aneurysm. If you look at the cross sections, this is the artery, this is the venous pouch, and this is the stent that has been placed here. And there was a thrombosis happening and a remodeling in the artery in a circular fashion. And that was surprising. And then flow diverter, uh, then what happened is we took it from there and started looking a little bit deeper. These are high frame angiograms showing you the same phenomena. So before placement of the stent and after placement of the stent, you wouldn't see a part of the aneurysm. And then first we thought it is an interaction between the alloy and the, the blood component. So we used a different material. You see, this is your, your, um, uh, your tantalum material and down there is nickel titanium. And we studied these animals for six months and there was a difference as far as the intimal buildup is concerned. 
We had more reaction with tantalum, which we then later didn't use, as you know, but nickel titanium basically prevailed as to be a good material. And then some parts went into hemodynamics and the engineering work. And at that time, there was a technology called laser-induced fluorescence technology, which is a semi-quantitative way to study flow and also other properties when you develop uh, wings or planes. Since you are in Seattle, you know how that is. And then what we did is we created these sidewall aneurysms like the canine one made out of plexiglass. We put some uh, agent that's immune uh, fluorescence agent into the flow loop. The conditions were similar to the posterior and anterior circulation. And then we injected, and you see this typical uh, behavior of this uh, dye, of this uh, fluorescence dye. And when we then went and placed one of those um, stents across the neck of this uh, of this uh, aneurysm in the in this plastic model. What we saw then is that there was a flow stagnation, and there were only smaller parts of the aneurysms that were um, involved in this in the blood circulation. This is how it looks at very high frame rate, three hundred frames per second, using laser induced fluorescence over the entire pulse cycle. So simplified systole, diastole here. And what we saw is there was a very complex flow behavior between the parent artery and aneurysm complex that involved the parent vessel as well. And surgeon will respect that because they often see that the associated vessels are undergoing some degenerative process with deposition of calci calcified material or also fatty tissues. So this is a fairly complex matter that is not only a focal, basically, growth of aneurysm, but it involves the entire uh, parent vessel as well. We, 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 what we did it then in this model, we started placing the tantalum and the nitinol stents with various porosities. So this is an 85 porous stent, that means 15% metal, and the remaining 85% is free metal. And what we saw, there was a threshold around 70% uh, metal free, so 30% metal, where there was a flow stagnation achieved over the pulse cycle within the aneurysm pouch. And when we then move from the posterior circulation to the anterior circulation, what we found that suddenly the entire flow domain became very instable. So it told us, it told us that we have to basically tailor our devices to the needs of the local flow. And that's um, what, uh, we embarked on as the next journey. So we defined with this study, which was semi-quantitative, the term porosity. So porosity is nothing else than total surface area of the tissue subtracted by the metal surface area over the total surface area multiplied by 100. So a porosity of 80 means 20% metal. Porosity of 60% means 40% metal. Most of the brain stents that you use in your daily practice have a porosity somewhere around 84, 85%. That means the metal amount is about 15%. Flow diverters on the other side have a porosity of 60 to 70%. And I'll explain shortly why that's the case. That means their metal amount is somewhere around 40 to 30%. Then to depart from laser semi-quantitative, we embarked using computational studies. At that time, it was finite element, which was very difficult to handle in the 90s, and the packages have improved a lot, and the engineering power has improved. What it helped us to do is to understand, in a simpler way, the dynamics between the parent vessel, the aneurysm, but also study the behavior of the, the pressures within the system, as well as the shear forces. And that's what's plotted out. Sorry. Hmm. Sorry, guys. Something happened here. That's plot that's plotted in this in this um, in this uh, slide here. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, there's something that happened here. Doesn't want to go back. Anyway, so what we found out there was no significant difference between the parent vessel as far as pressures are concerned and the aneurysm itself, which makes a sense because it's a closed environment. The only difference was the acceleration of the pressure and the time delay of the systolic pressure traveling 
in the parent vessel and then going into the aneurysm. So there was a delay when we introduced a stent or a flow diverter. Then we move from the semi-quantitative to a quantitative methodology called particle image velocimetry. What particle image velocimetry means is we disperse the flow field with glass particles at size of erythrocytes, about 12, 12 microns. And then we apply two mathematic equations. One is called Eulerian, the other is Lagrangian. So what we can do is we can shine these particles with laser light, laser sheet, and what it does is it, it tells us like when you do scuba diving, how the school of fish moves. So we're at a very high frequency of the laser sheet that's cutting this flow domain, we can not only tell you the direction of this of the, the, the particles moving, but also their velocity. So we had then established a method to calculate the impact on the flow domain, especially on the aneurysm after placing these stents. And you can very well appreciate that there is not only a change in direction of the, of the flow, but also the reduction of the velocity. And then with that said, we move then into, into, the, into, the, into the field of braiding because braiding was the easiest way, the easiest way to basically create these implantable devices. And you see one of the, the large braiders here illustrated in this video tape. So what we did is then we created a single layer braiding because the easy thing was about the, we, about the single layer braiding is that you can control a lot of different parameters, which otherwise are uncontrollable. So we came up with this idea of using the mini version of wall stent, you would say, using various uh, braiders here. And then we, uh, we define the different parts of the braiders. And you see here, the most important thing to remember is the braid angle here, which is here um, indicated by beta, but also the porosity. And then I will come to the term of mesh density and the size of the cells, which are around 350 to 400 microns to allow the endothelium to go away. Then there are other parameters like the diameters and length of the device that's for you important for the clinical setting. After that, what followed were several R01 grants and the, the NIH with help of, of course, many of my colleagues who were at the study section believed in this technology and supported us the development and the refinement of this device. So what we then create is our system models. So we created a brain aneurysm system models from animal work, from 3D printing, from uh, the device manufacturing sites, from MRI on and on to basically create an environment where we cleanly could optimize, optimize these devices. So at that time, the, the elastase model from the rabbit was popular and accepted by the NIH and by the FDA as well. And I think it has remained that way for now. So in short nutshell, it is just ligation of the one of the common carotids and elastase infusion. And then a few weeks later, you get your aneurysm. So what we then did is we basically created a replica of this rabbit aneurysm model here, um, very simplified and attached the whole thing to a, what we call it a pulse duplicator, artificial heart that basically creates all the conditions that the human heart can do. And we implanted several devices of different mesh densities and porosities and used the laser uh, particle image velocimetry to study the impact of the devices as far as the uh, flow properties in the aneurysm is concerned and the flow reduction, but also you could calculate based on the velocity vectors, the shear rates, this is before placement of the flow diverters, and then after, and you will see there's a significant, significant difference dependent on the different devices we use. And you can study, of course, in the proximal neck as well, what the shear forces do. We think shear forces are important for endothelial damage. And what the goal was of these flow diverters to stabilize and bring the shear forces in a physiological, um, into the physiological realm. And that's what these, these devices are doing. They're not only serving as a matrix for endothelium, but also stabilizing the boundary flows and uncoupling the flow going from the parent vessel into the aneurysm. 
And then we developed several flow diverters, and then you play tic-tac-toe. You calculate the mean hydrodynamic circulation in the energy. That means how long does the blood circulate when you place the flow diverters. You can calculate mathematically the mean kinetic energy transferred with each pulse cycle between the parent vessel and the aneurysm. And then you choose the best of three for mean kinetic energy as well as mean circulation time. And then you go back from the model to the, to the rabbit and then you test them. So we looked also, of course, in these models, what happens to side branches that are covered. The vertebral artery in the rabbit served as a surrogate. And what we saw, there was only a slight difference in the flow of those jailed vessels um, as compared for no device, but there was a difference in the flow, um, in, the, in, the, in the laminar flow and in the flow um, characteristics. So the total flow remained the same, almost the same, but the characteristics of the flow changed uh, uh, while uh, after placement of these uh, devices. Then we went, like I said, back to the bunnies and used the three optimized devices uh, into the aneurysm elastase model. This is how it looks. And geographically, you place the device. Of course, there is a change in the, in the geometry of vessel, which people have uh, correctly noticed. That impacts, of course, the flow. But then you see a little bit less filling of the aneurysm. And then you wait six months, um, and you see that the aneurysms are gone. So what you can do is with these angiogram, you can study the contrast absorption. So basically the photon absorption within the aneurysm and you can plot it out. So before the flow diverter, the contrast goes in and then it washes out over time. After placement of the flow diverter, you will see on the graph on the lower end that there's less contrast that goes in. It stays there for a while and then it washes out. What you then do is you basically do Fourier transformation and clean up the functions and come with a mathematical function. And that's what I will show you in the next uh, few slides. So in the flow domain, we talk about two, two terms, convection and diffusion. Convection is, uh, is if, for example, just to give an example, if you open up the window and the door and there's a strong gradient that is created and takes the air through the room. That would be convection. And diffusion would be like, if you would close the window, but through the cracks, there's still some flow going through the room. It's noticeable by your skin, but it's not as violent. And these two properties are that do, uh, basically govern the flow in the, in the aneurysm. And there are some parameters that uh, this was Barry Lieber who wrote it together, parameters that are important and that are being involved in this, in this function that was created by Barry. And the second part is, like I said, diffusion. So the goal is when we place the flow diverter to move from convection to diffusion to allow a stable thrombus formation associated with the reduction of the flow within the energy. These are how the mathematical curves look after Fourier transformation. You have the convection contrast goes in or blood goes in and washes out. And after uh, placement of the device, you have this diffusion that takes the contrast slowly to wash out after placement of the device. And this is the resulting uh, composite. So what we then did is we placed these devices. We used two devices very similar as far as the porosity is, as far as the porosity is concerned. So 30% metal free, 70, sorry, 30% metal, 70% metal free, and a pore density of 12 pores per square millimeter in one device, and in the other, twice as many pores per square millimeter. And then what we did is we added a third one, which had a lower porosity, that means more metal, but had less pores per square millimeter as compared to the third device. And then we looked at the ra rabbit occlusion data, and what we found out that if the samples have the same porosity, in this case, 70 millimeters, sorry, 70%, but have twice as many pores per square millimeter, the occlusion rates of these aneurysms was significantly higher and it stayed stable over six months. So we introduced that terminology of porosity. And then when you look at the mean and geographic occlusion, you will recognize that the, the, the device with the higher porosity as compared to the lower one had a higher occlusion, but the main driving force was the mesh density. 
for pore density. In other words, if you have a same, same device with less pores per square millimeter, the impact on the mean angiographic occlusion was lower. What does that mean in lay terms? In lay terms, if you look at this checkerboard and you see black and white, the ratio will be 50. So here the metal coverage would be 50% or porosity of 50. And there will be two pores per diamond. On the right side, you have the same ratio of black and white of 50%. The difference only is that you have 16 times more black and whites on the right side. That's exactly what mesh density is or pore density means. While the porosity in both of them is 50%, the pore density or mesh density is 16 times higher in the right than in the left side. How do we get from one to the other? By just reducing the size of the filament and increasing the number of the filaments. That has been proven also by this study from the Belgian group, De Boyle, who took a 3D data set from a supraclinoid aneurysm and ran particles and computational work through this aneurysm. And what they found out that in fact, adding number of the wires and increasing the mesh density has a higher impact reduction of the flow exchange between parent vessel and the aneurysm. It has also, a, as expected, an impact on the shear forces experienced by the aneurysm itself. Now, other advantages of having tighter mesh is that the geometry of the cell size naturally doesn't change much. So if you cover a long segment of an artery with mismatch in diameters of the vessel, you will recognize that the tighter the mesh, the less there is a variation in the cell size and the shape of the cell size. That's what we call a consistent mesh across the, uh, across the segment that is being traded. Why is that important? It's important for the exchange of the blood flow between the parent artery and aneurysm. It avoids these gaps of blood flow going into the aneurysm that potentially may lead to rupture. This is how it looks. Interestingly, on histology here at 21 days, you have clots. And then over time, the collagen deposit occurs from the perimeter from the aneurysm towards the neck. So even if an aneurysm that's treated with a flow diverter is not completely occluded, what you will see is that it will be stable and the likelihood of rupture is low. It's not zero because we are dealing with biology. So there are some changes happening in the wall infrequently that may lead to rupture and we still don't understand that. And a complete healing is then done here in the rabbit model about six months after deployment of the device. And we can, we can follow that in nice way also in humans. This is a study we published a while ago showing that it takes a year or sometimes in some patients two years for a complete healing and endothelialization. And there's a small group of patients that never endothelializes. We looked at CD34 marking and we could find that these cells that populated the, the mesh were in fact a true endothelial cells. What happened about the neointimal thickness? As we go more and more distal into smaller vessels, we have to look into that carefully to avoid thromboembolic complications, but also in stenosis. With the device one, which had a porosity of 70%, but 11 or 12 pores per square millimeter, the thickness of the intima was larger than the device that has finer mesh, but the same porosity. And of course, uh, this device, which had a intermediate was uh, between the both two devices, had a, has a mean intimal thickness of 170 microns. What that tells us that the further we go distal in the bed, we have to consider making finer and finer mesh, but keep the property of the device uh, adjusted to the flow property of smaller vessels because the flow property is different than in the internal carotid artery or the vertebral or basilar artery. So we have to adjust. And you know that currently they're working on a 40 wire device that has slightly different porosity and different mesh density as compared to those devices that are being placed into the internal carotid artery. The other advantage of finer mesh can be illustrated in this simple manner. 
and you go back to your checkerboard and you will recognize that if you the yellow and red circles are perforators or side branches, then in the left checkerboard, which has a higher mesh density, the likelihood of the perforators to be occluded drops. This may drop, this may close, but the others may stay open because the opening of the cells is not impeding on the flow that is going through the perforators. On the right side, same metal coverage, 50% porosity, but 16 times less mesh density. There are several perforators that theoretically will close. This one will close because it's completely covered by the metal. This may close, sorry, this may close, and these three definitely will close. So there is a beneficial value of using finer mesh and finer struts. It's only then an engineering and alloy matter because these devices will get more and more slinky and their stiffness or their, their, uh, by their strength in the artery to stay open uh, may be a challenge. And after we did all the basic work uh, that took us quite a long um, time, and then we went to first in man in Heidelberg 2009. This was at that time easily coilable, but we decided to treat that with a flow diverter. And you see, after placing the flow diverter, there is this flow stagnation. That's the conversion we talked about. And there is, sorry, diffusion. And there's some convection here in the distal part of the aneurysm. And you see in the entire run along this, uh, this contrast lingers there, the diffusion part. And over time where you see the chorioretinal blush and into the venous space, and there's still the contrast lagging and we bring the patient back six months later the aneurysm is gone the artery shows as if it's normal with some geometrical changes the ophthalmic artery remains open and we see in cases that it may shut down if there's a demand from the external carotid so it's a gradient issue that's driving of course the uh, flow through the side branches so in summary the important thing is to recognize that that two things that are important to understand while dealing with flow diverter. The flow that goes between the side branches and the main artery is flow driven by the pressure gradient between the right atrium and the left ventricle. The flow that goes from the parent vessel inside the aneurysm during the pulse cycle is because there is no outlet in the aneurysm, is a momentum transfer during acceleration and deceleration of blood flow with each pulse cycle. So what we are doing with the flow diverter is basically increasing a resistance in front of that momentum transfer and disrupt the momentum. And that's the fundamental goal of these devices. This is a case that Dr. De Vries tried to clip. It was calcified, both aneurysms. So then he closed and we decided to put the flow diverter here. And you see the aneurysm at follow-up are closed, but there is some buildup at the entrance, and we know that these are biofluids, sometimes cell elements and endothelial cells that are starting growing here. And infrequently, you will see in the MCA, which is not my area where I like to place a flow diverter personally, but where you see due to the reduction of the pressure gradient and the PL vessels filling from the back door, you may see sometimes that the entire M2 division uh, closes off. So what we learned from flow diversion is that we have to select our patients carefully. I think the principle what we described in the early work of disruption of flow momentum transfer into the aneurysm sac is the driving force for a progressive remodeling of the vessel wall through initially formation of thrombus and endothelialization. It is a user-friendly technology, but dual antiplatelet it is necessary, and that's why we are embarking coded systems. I think the safety profile is acceptable low. Of course, there's always room for improvement. And I think we get 70 to 90% occlusion in one to two years in most of our patients. The subgroup of basilar trunk aneurysm remains a challenge. We have some solutions there to offer, and I think we will do improvement. So having said that, all these concepts that were then later proven through the studies here, you see the large aneurysm puff study, nice results. The SENT study showed the same thing for intradural aneurysm and expansion of the indication to the terminus ICA. 
Then the small premier study came um, that showed for small aneurysm, the efficacy of flow diverter here, a coronal artery aneurysm we treated. So you are all familiar with that. But the interesting thing now is we are moving from the parent vessel to endosacular implants. And the problem with all these endosacular implants is once again, the same what we had described with the computational model. And that is deformation of the material and fatigue of material before a proper healing is, uh, has occurred. So the challenges remain delayed incomplete healing in large aneurysm and in ruptured aneurysm, and then delayed healing dependent on locations such as MCA or basilar top aneurysm. When you look at the studies from pipeline, you will see the problem is not only location, but also the age of the population. Here, if you plot the age of the population, you will recognize the senior population is in far as their healing is concerned, they drop significantly by 20 to 40%. And yet, as we go along with the shift in demographics, we are treating more and more patients that are senior. So what do we expect is probably less occlusion rates and less benefits. We did a subgroup analysis of the SEND study here, Kaplan Meyer, showing you almost 20% drop in healing response in senior population as compared to the older population. And we think that's related to a reduction in the endothelial mobility of endothelial precursor cells. This is a diagram showing you the path of healing, starting with the hemostasis through the process of inflammation where lymphocytes and neurotrophils are involved. Then it goes to the phase of proliferation where macrophages, neutrophils, fibroblasts, and other elements start populating the clotted area and doing the remodeling process to create a scarring and a strong tissue. So what we are working now over the last 10 years is we are introducing a new technology called photobiomodulation to address the healing, delayed healing and enhance the healing. So our studies have shown with the laser technology that we are introducing that we can shorten the healing process, at least in the bunnies, from six months down to three days, up to 21 days. And how does that work? And I want in the last slides to basically introduce you to the most recent research we are bringing into this field. So what we have created is an optical microfiber with the size of 100 micron, which is then uh, inserted through a tube, uh, through this cage, which centers the laser. And we use a certain wavelength and energy dose, and that is sent to the wall of the aneurysm. This is the non-disposable component, which is the laser box. And this is the optical microfiber with the lens, which is a special lens carrying all the energy from the outer source to the aneurysm. To optimize and determine the proper wavelengths for these, um, this kind of treatment and the dosage, we started with step one and did a testing of the response of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and then tested them in a co-culture and then in various uh, cultures where we populated the existing co-culture with mesenchymal cell, cells in the test. And we have done these studies with single fibers as well as with structures like the flow diverters. And what we found out here in the model, and I will make it ever shorter due to time, if we use three-day sample here in an aneurysm that was treated with a flow diverter, you will see the aneurysm is still open and there's a clot. With the light therapy, we see clot and at three days already early endothelialization of the flow diverter and the neck of the aneurysm and some endothelialization of the flow diverter and adjacent parent vessel. At 10 days, we see still open, the aneurysm is open. Without the laser therapy, you see the stent, the flow diverter populated with, with endothelial cells. And when you compare it with the sample that was treated with light therapy, with laser light therapy, we see already scarring at 10 days with a complete neck occlusion. That was a surprise that it goes so fast. And what we then did is we did, we did biomarker. I don't know what happened here. We then stained with biomarkers for alpha smooth muscle cells, which is non-specific for my epithelial cells. 
that are responsible for healing. And we also did antibody staining for smooth muscle cells, that's 30, CD31+. plus. And what we found out that in the sample where there were flu diverters without light therapy, we rarely saw antigen smooth muscles and actin positive cells, nor cells positive for endothelial adhesion molecule one. But in the sample that was treated with photobiomodulation, within the clotted area, we saw bands of cell elements that were positive for alpha smooth muscle cell actin and that were positive for CD31 uh, antigen. And you see these cells populate not only the aneurysm wall, but the parent vessel wall and also the clot. So there is a composite from cell elements, probably from the blood, but also from the vessel wall. When we do further staining, we recognize that we don't have only neutrophils and lymphocytes in, in this aneurysm as a sign of inflammation, but we saw an abundance of fibroblast and myofibroblast, which then differentiate to smooth muscle cell and collagen in the sample that was treated with laser light. Now, laser light treatment is nothing new. As some of you know, it's used for superficial lesions, such as birthmarks and sores, here a child treated with a laser light uh, for capillary hemangioma or an ulcer here in this lady. Many dental offices have these laser lights. There's a lot of basic signs how laser light works. In a nutshell, it is basically an upregulation due to upregulation of protein synthesis in the mitochondrial membrane of the, of the eukaryote cells, so human cells, due to electron transfer at certain oxidase. To simplify, it's like when the plant gets the light outside through the chlorophyll development in the cell, you see that the plant leaves are transforming to green. Uh, and that's a similar process. So laser light is basically being absorbed in, the, in, those, in, those, um, in those chromoform uh, and the electric, uh, uh, electronic transfer basically enhances the protein synthesis. We think that photobiomodulation is a revolutionary treatment and we are introducing it into the endovascular treatment realm. And I think that this is uh, an interesting time where regenerative medicine will basically enhance the implantable devices in the patients. And I assume that our senior patient hopefully will benefit with that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wakalu. It was an amazing lecture. Uh, I guess Dr. McDowell maybe wants to start with some comment or question. Yeah, I mean, that was, it was just so fun to sort of see that arc of that journey you've uh, been on and, and really led led us all down that path. So that was that was really fun to, to see that. Uh, obviously, we're all in this field because we like the new and exciting things and so the, the photobiomodulation is is uh really intriguing and really interesting and i'd i'd love to hear a little bit more about that too um the the dosage of that uh strikes me as a, a really difficult technical problem in terms of uh how 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 big is the therapeutic window for for that that treatment so we have done so far, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Cameron for the question, very important question. So the, there are a few things and I didn't go into the detail due to time. So there's a whole presentation around the photobiomodulation. So we started first with the development of the fiber optics and it came from the field called phototrombosis. So there were groups working on creating in animals um, a stroke model in the mice by using laser light therapy. They would cook the endothelial cells and create a white clot. So when we were seeing that, we thought that there may be a window of opportunity to reduce the energy dose and see what happens to the arteries. So we started the work back in 2003, 2004. And the most challenging part was for us to develop the optical fiber because the optical fiber is about the thickness of a hair, around 100 microns, and it fractures. So the energy that you send through the optics doesn't reach the tip because it dissipates along the wall. So that took us almost 10 years to come up with a fiber that doesn't fracture, especially knowing the tortuosity we have to go into the cerebrovascular. That was one challenge. 
The second challenge was to optimize the energy. So like with sun tanning, we didn't want to go to the sun and come out still white and without a suntan, but we didn't want to get a sunburn. We wanted a sun tanning. And that tanning process, which we call optimization of the energy, is based currently on calculation of the surface of the aneurysm to the geometry of the aneurysm. So what we require right now is you have to give us the size of the aneurysm and we have a formula to within less than 10% calculate the surface of the aneurysm. And the surface of the aneurysm gives us the amount of time. It's a single, you know, single dose, the amount of time, how much we have to, you know, shine the light. So of course, there's within a gray zone between burning and, and doing nothing. So we are working in a fairly broad spectrum where we don't burn the endothelial cells. We are working on a next generation where the fiber runs like an ultrasound. The amount of energy that's being received and reflected from the wall of the aneurysm will be received through the same fiber. And we can tell you which amount is basically sent to the aneurysm. Right now, we calculate it mathematically. Then the third thing, which is important, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, no, finish and then I'll ask. Yes, the third important thing is and uh, is that the laser probe gets super hot, Cameron, super hot. So what you have to do is you have to constantly flush it through an XT27. So the cage and fiber optic goes to an XT27. The cage centers the fiber, the tip of the fiber, that the aneurysm wall doesn't get burned. And... And it centers also, but allows also at the same time, the microcatheter to go with a saline solution to cool down the laser at the top. And it washes also the environment of blood. You need some blood particles, of course, to activate certain cellular elements like platelets, red blood cells, on and on. Um, but we need to wash it. And depending on the size of the aneurysm, uh, the amounts can reach up to 10, 15 cc's per minute. So what we do is we jail basically the cage with a flow diverter and we wash the, the, the aneurysm with the saline solution, water saline solution during the two, five minutes of radiation time. How specific is the, is the wavelength uh, in terms of doing the, the, having the biological effect? Is, is, it, is, is it delivery of energy or does it have to be that specific wavelength? Wavelengths. That was the that 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 was another surprise. But some of us thought we knew it. Others say, "Well, it came as a surprise." There's a very specific range of wavelengths. And if I could go in a completely different direction now, through this whole um, journey of the materials, and and I'm wondering why. It was always metals. Why was there never any, or never at least that I was aware of, any interest in in plastic flow diverters, for example? Yes. So we started the journey when I was in Buffalo. I reached out to to Philadelphia. They have this uh, Drexel University. Drexel University, you know, they came with this whole project for, and then uh, they started making a lot of industry tennis rackets, all that. I met there a group, Kalidindi and Gobran. And I proposed them the project and they said, okay, let us do um, polymers. So we did probably 50, 60 polymer devices and with marker bands and everything. And we patented that also in those days. They are expired, it's so long time ago. And then we went into the rabbit model and swine model that was pre-requirement, the swine. And it created a lot of inflammation. That was one thing. The inflammation crushed the whole polymer mesh tube uh, so the arteries would close off. Then we started working on metal structures with polymer coating. And then what we saw is that there was still a lot of inflammation going on. Then we thought maybe we need a dissolvable material. So I embarked the journey with a German guy in Hamburg. He was engineer in polymer for 17 or 18 years. He had a lot of experience. He said, stay away from that. I said, why? He said, because it's very difficult to control the absorption of degradable materials. And since you're talking to me about perforators, I'm worried that during the process of 
the material getting dissolved, you may get this sugar cane, a sugar can, what is it called? Sugar stink effect that the crystals can be fine, but they can also break in bigger pieces and create a thromboembolic phenomena. So he advised me, we did some work, but he advised me to stay away. And that was back in 2005, 2006. There, there is there, uh, and there are a number of, of people who are looking still at, at bioabsorbable stents, and certainly in cardiology. Yes. Uh, you're 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 skeptical, or or so, the technology has changed. Yeah, I know. I was approached who you know, Dr. Wang Zhong Wang, who has done an amazing and great work, great research, and um, there were two papers I saw from Japan, also on degradable materials. Um, and it comes from the coronary literature, right? The problem I see is that some of the degradable materials take two years. And, and then they say the process, well, then the question is two years, where is the help for the patient if it takes two years? Um, and we are working on this optical stuff where we think we can do it in a month. Uh, and then you are now battling between coded versus degradable material with the potential of thromboembolic problems, material long-term problems. Where does the material go? Does it go in liver? Is it, uh, so there are a lot of toxicology issues around degradable materials, which will remain a challenge at the FDA level. I'm sure the FDA Cameron will dig into that very, very carefully. So I'm skeptical, you're right. <laughs> Well, well, I think your skepticism and, and uh, observations have led you down a lot of great places. So uh, I think that's a very positive, <laughs> positive trait. <laughs> uh, you guys do that for a living, of course. Uh, okay, Dr. Walu, uh, a few questions from my side. So first of all, what is the maximum level of complexity of the bench models of flow diversion that you use? Because we know that, you know, apart from usually we use silicon models and everything, but there are many properties yes. about like ontogenic <clears throat> properties and flow changes with capillaries. Yeah. So Matthias, thank you very much. Thanks again for invitation and putting this together. I know that's a lot of work. Your question is well taken. So when we when we do the the studies in complex systems like animals, or we move then to the humans, the 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 basic flow is governed by equations that uh, fluid mechanicians know that. Uh, and those um, those are assumptions like Newtonian fluids. We know Newtonian fluids when you go to capillary uh, doesn't hold true because the plasma goes around the cells and the cells are in the center. But when we assume Newtonian fluid uh, in under stable conditions, then we are talking about laminar pulsatile flow. We are talking about disturbed flow. We are talking about um, about uh, vortices. Oh no, no, that terminology we use. And there are two parameters that govern these flows. One is called the Reynolds number. You are familiar with Reynolds number in the aorta is in the ballpark of 500 versus 100 or 80 in the carotid arteries. And then Wormsy numbers. Wormsy numbers is another. Uh, number that fluid mechanic uses, and that is based on the heartbeat. And there are other parameters that go like viscosity of the fluid on and on. So these two parameters can very well control in, an, in, a, in a plastic model when you mimic a structure like the one of a rabbit elastase on human. These boundary conditions we call can be mimicked very well. We can mimic also very well the viscosity of the fluid by adding certain chemicals to it. However, we cannot mimic platelets, red blood cells, biofluids, and all these complex things. People are trying that. And the clotting cascade in a plastic tube. So these, these biological, I would call, parameters are very difficult to control. Now, the third part is the boundary itself, which is the plastic tube. We came from rigid tube, like you saw in the uh, semi-quantitative study where we use laser-induced fluorescence to more uh, uh, elastic and compliant material like the silicon, we can make them thinner. 
But you know, vessel wall are unisotropic. So adventitia is stiffer, the muscularis constantly goes to adaptation due to the parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. The, the endothelial goes through a transformation. So this inner, in anisotropy of vessel wall is very difficult to mimic in these plastic tubes. So they are within the boundaries, some errors build in, but what it does is from the engineering aspect, it helps us to optimize before we go to a rabbit or an animal surrogate, or we go to a human. So like with the airplanes, you are in the city of airplanes, Boeing, you see what they do is they take the big planes and make them smaller, the wings and all that, and they study that in airflow. And then they optimize and then they do a dry run outside and build it up. We do the, exactly the same, but reverse, Matia. We make big things and then we shrink them to small before we go into humans. I know this is not what you wanted to hear, but we are trying to get better and better with our predictive values of these model systems. Okay, one more question. Um, what do you think is the role of OCT? I mean, one of your colleagues, Dr. Gaunis, has been speaking with us about it also yes. a few weeks ago. And do you think it's going to influence the way we select flow diverters and the design and porosity? Uh, again, Cameron will say you are very skeptical. <laughs> so I'm by nature skeptical. I'm sorry. But here's the thing. I was at the fence with the OCT technology because I have seen the evolution like you, and I'm sure Dr. McDougall remembers that, when intravascular ultrasound came. I was in Buffalo then, and we all jumped on Ivis and you with Randy, I think you were with Randy at that time. We said, that's the holy grail for carotid stenting, and we can go deeper and deeper. And then we all bought the machine, the console, the fibers, and the cardiology, a lot of, we did a lot of, and then it died out. You know why? Because it was impractical. Nobody wanted to have a stent placed in the carotid, do postplasty, and then go again with the optics there and to see whether it's well positioned. I think for certain things, it will be good, like knowing whether we are doing an ICAD or we are dealing with a dissection of the artery before placing a stent or doing angioplasty, follow-up of certain things, monitoring of certain things. It may be good for research. It's a great tool. But do I think that all flow dividers or coiling of aneurysm will be monitored with OCT? I have my doubts. Okay, understand. Uh, you've been involved in this uh, study of the triple anticoagulation with the Buffalo Group for the posterior circulation aneurysms. Yes. Do we have any evolution since then in the thinking process of posterior circulation aneurysms and flow diversion? Yes. Yeah, I just said yesterday, a patient from uh, Leahy who called me, he's two years out and he wanted to talk about the management. What I'm doing is I moved away from triple therapy to two therapy. So I put the patients on Eliquis. So what I do is I don't pre-treat the patients before doing them. And I learned that from Dr. McDougall. And he started the whole concept not to pre-treat patients but before dropping the floor diverter to give ftfibatide, loading those and keep them on drip. And I adopted that and I thought that was a very smart idea because the moment you rupture the aneurysm or you perforate a vessel, you are then, you know, you're locked in now. Now, you know, the things get very hairy. So I learned that from Cameron. And what I then did is I said, okay, the posterior circulation, we place the catheters. Now we do more radial. And then before placing the device, I heparinize the patient with an ACT of 250, and I do integrin full bolus after I place the device. And then I keep the patient in the ICU with a very tight blood pressure monitoring uh, in the mean around 100, so generally systolic 140. And then the second day, I switch to Eliquis, five milligrams BID, and then start stop the drip and start with the Berlinta, Ticragalor. So I don't use Eliquis, Plavix, and Aspirin. I use Ticragalor. Some people use Prasogirl and one blood thinners for six months. And then I start tapering down the Eliquis from five milligram BID to two and a half milligram as tolerated by the patient. And then start taking back the Berlinta from 60 milligram BID down to 30 milligrams, and then keep them lifelong either on aspirin, if tolerated, 
or go back to one of the antiplatelet treatments. This takes two, three years. I have patients now, about six years ago, we, I'm following about 15 patients and um, all of them are alive. These are the dolicoactatic aneurysms. And I, I think it's important not to mix them up with these simple fenestrated aneurysms or this dissecting uh, aneurysm. These are truly fusiform dolicoactatic aneurysms. What I've seen is that the closure of the aneurysm is delayed with Eliquis for sure. But what I see is that the perforator occlusion drops and the morbidity and mortality goes down with this treatment. Okay, and one last question. Uh, are you also skeptic of uh, surface modifications and you know, like the shield technology, the X technology? Or do you, see, do you see any future in that? I'm skeptical, um, it's true. Um, I want to see when we talk about surface modification, are we talking about helping the little perforators from clogging? Like you saw in one of the patients, there was some debris. Are we seeing less debris and closure of M2 divisions, for example, and yet treatment of the aneurysm? Uh, or are we talking about taking off the patients a month later uh, from the dual antiplate? Somebody can show me those uh, you know, numbers not single case reports. I've seen patients without antiplatelet from the beginning. They just stop next day and they're fine. I want to see a larger population that uh, can live a month after the fluid divider without, uh, without antiplatelet agents. And I've not seen that with shields or HPC coding or anything else. And that's why I'm skeptical. All right. Yeah. Um, I think we've taken uh, more of your time than we should have this morning. I really want to thank you for being here. It's just wonderful to spend some time with you. And you know, thank you not just for this morning, but really for an amazing uh, lifetime of contributions to our field. This you know, completely revolutionized uh, our two biggest things that I've seen in my career and just had the, you know, delight of seeing the evolution flow diverters and stent retrievers and you've been at the forefront of both and it's just uh just amazing to uh have you as a colleague and to have you here this morning and thank you for all you've done for us thank you for the invitation cameron and i want to thank from bottom of my heart you know what i think about you you are the greatest and also thank you for all your great contributions to this field and i have learned from you a lot a lot not only in the field but outside the field and I want to thank you for the friendship. Thank you so much, Cameron. Uh, it's my my pleasure. And thank uh, you so great, much. great, great seeing you. You have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Good luck with, with Texas. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.